I hate surveys. <laughs> oh, I do. You know, Matt's right. Surveys are no fun, but I got to tell you something. This is, uh, he was right when he said this might be a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to kind of peel back some layers of the onion and look at ourselves and look at our community. And I promise you, anytime we do something as a church that's designed to make us more useful in God's kingdom, it will be blessed. So I encourage you, go ahead and take the time, fill out this survey when it's finally released. Uh, there's no reason why we can't do this together as a family. Get 100% participation in this. Um, every so often, <clears throat> and I haven't done this for a while, I like to preach a certain kind of sermon. And I haven't done it in a while, and this certain kind of sermon I refer to as the Sunday School Sermon. I don't know how many of you grew up going to church, and, and maybe even before church you'd go to Sunday school, right? As a little kid, you'd go to a little class, and you'd, they'd give you a lollipop and keep you out of your parents' hair for a while, and you'd learn Bible stories. This is how we got introduced to all the, the great Bible stories, uh, especially in the Old Testament, stories like Noah, right? And Adam and Eve, and King David, and, and Jonah and the whale, right? All these great stories. That's how we got introduced to them. Now, understand, we got introduced to a maybe a watered-down version of the story. Sometimes you've got to do that with the Bible, because the Bible is not a G-rated movie. It's not a PG-13. It's, it's an R-rated flick. The stuff in the Bible is blunt, it is raw, and it is that way because, well, human beings are involved in it. So we go to Sunday school as little kids, or even if you didn't go to Sunday school, some of these stories you learn through little books you may have or little movies you might have watched, you learn all these great stories and you kind of walk away from Sunday school here. Yeah, I know the story of Jonah. I got it. You know, the fish eats him and hawks him up on the land three days later. I got it. I know that story. But you never go back as an adult and look at the story and say, what's the real story behind some of these things? What's God's message in these stories for me? So this morning, we're going to do a Sunday school sermon. This morning, we're going to look at one of my all-time favorites. We're going to look at Samson. You know about Samson? A lot of people are shaking their head. You know the whole story of Samson, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm setting you up. Listen, we know some things about Samson, but we really don't know the depth of this story. Here's what we learned in Sunday school. God told Samson, as long as you have long hair, you're going to be very strong. You're going to be very strong. Don't cut your hair because you're going to be very strong. And you're going to be this real big guy, and you're going to be able to do all these great feats of strength. Matter of fact, the very first story we see with a great feat of strength about Samson is he kills a lion with his bare hands. Man, that is cool stuff. Especially when I was a little kid. Oh, this guy's my hero. He's killing lions with his bare hands. It's amazing. And you know what else? He was a hero because he went out and he fought against the enemies of God. And he took the jawbone of a donkey and he killed a thousand people with a jawbone of a donkey. That's cool, man. That's like Rambo in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, right? <laughs> We love this dude. But then, then, we, well, then we saw this story uh, about Samson, about this lying, deceitful, no good, backstabbing, two-faced she-devil that tricked Samson, right? Tricked him into giving away the secret to his strength, and she just sucked the life right out of him. And young men, get, if you're not married, take this to heart, right? I'm just saying, just a little tip from your Uncle Jay there. So we see this story about, you know, how he was, this poor Samson was tricked into, into giving away his secret. But then we see at the end of his life, we see that Samson gets the last laugh, right? Because he pulls down the pillars of this large temple with himself in it, and he kills thousands of God's enemies. And he dies a martyr, and he dies in the service of God. That's the stories we were told as little kids about Samson. But that's only about this much of the story. That's only that much of the truth. There's a deeper and fuller meaning to this story than you might imagine. So we're going to look at the story, the lifetime of Samson, and see if there's any lessons that we can draw from this. Before we start, the very first thing, the most important, the three most important things when you start to read a story in the Bible are what? Context. What's number two? Context. And what's number three? Context. We need to understand what's going on. We need to understand a little bit about what's going on at this time in, in biblical history. The story of Samson occurs during the time of the judges. Time of the judges. Now, the Israelites had no king at this time. And so when they needed guidance, when they needed help, they would turn to these judges. And these judges were just Israelite people who had risen up during this time to unify the people, 
to get the people to repent of their sins, to fix their problems, to address their spiritual issues. And at times, their job was to protect the kingdom of Israel from outside threats. Judges were sometimes military leaders who knew how to mobilize an army and attack an enemy force, but their real power lies in their knowledge and their ability to adjudicate Israelite law as they are guided by God. The story of Samson begins with the children of Israel, surprise, surprise, being ruled by a foreign power. We see this over and over again throughout Scripture. The Israelites had turned their back on God once again. They had done those things which God says was wrong, and he put them into captivity. He turns his back on his people. This time, during the time of Samson, it was the Philistines. Now, they are one of the more persistent enemies of the Israelites. They're a group of pagan people. I was going to talk a little bit about how ruthless and how evil these people are. We just, we just don't have the time to do that this morning. But just think about the most heinous, evil, nasty person you know. <laughs> and multiply him by ten. And that's kind of what we're talking about the Philistines. They're, they're just, they, they worship gods that require human sacrifices. Some of these human sacrifices are children. I mean, these people are heinous people, and God has allowed his people to be ruled by them. Now, he doesn't want them to mix with them. He doesn't want them to engage in business with them. He certainly doesn't want them to marry any Philistines, but he is allowing them to rule over his people until they kind of snap out of it. In Judges chapter 13, God finally decides he's going to end this captivity. He's going to begin to end this, and God decides to raise up a judge from among the people. And as we find out, the person that he selected hasn't even been born yet. Hasn't even been conceived yet. The scripture says, again, the people of Israel did what the Lord said was wrong. So he handed them over to the Philistines for 40 years. There was a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan who lived in the city of Zorah. He had a wife, but she could not have children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, you have not been able to have children, but you will become pregnant and give birth to a son. But be careful, don't drink any wine or beer or eat anything that is unclean. Because you will become pregnant and have a son. You must never cut his hair because he will be a Nazarite given to God from birth. He will begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. Okay, full stop for a minute now. There are two concepts here that if you don't understand, you will not understand the story of Samson. There's two concepts here that you could read the story of Samson and get something out of it, but you're not going to get the full meaning from it. The first concept you need to understand is when God gives something, he gives it for a purpose. Particularly when he gives something that's miraculous or extraordinary. When he gives something, he has a purpose for doing it. There's a motivation behind why he's doing this. Here we find God choosing a woman who has no children, who is unable to have a child, so that he can bring a child into existence. He's acting miraculously. He's acting extraordinarily so that when that child arrives, not only will it be, wow, God gets the credit for that one, but it's also because he has a purpose. What he gives, he demands back for his purpose. And he goes to someone who doesn't have any children. It's not like he... You know, that's like he went to Gina Linden and said, Hey, Gina, you're going to get pregnant and have a kid. He goes, oh, yeah, tell me something I don't already have or don't already know. Right? She, she, big deal, right? God goes to Manoah's wife, who cannot have children. God goes to Abraham and Sarah, right, who are old, too old to have kids, and brings forth Isaac from there. God goes to Hannah, a woman who was childless, praying in the temple, please give me a child. He goes to her, and he brings forth Samuel. God goes to a teenage virgin named Mary who shouldn't have a child and says, I'm going to bring forth my son from you. God acts in this way. He goes to those who do not have, will not have, and gives to them. Why? For his own purpose. That's the first concept you need to understand. The second concept you need to understand is this right here. What does it mean to be a Nazarite? See, if you don't know what that means, this story is not going to have a whole lot of meaning for you. The Nazarite, or what's called the Nazarite vow, is when an Israelite would voluntarily take on a vow to be totally 
completely immersed in the work of God. The vow is an action or a decision on the part of a person to yield their will completely to God for some period of time to complete some task and be fully consumed with God. The word Nazarite comes from the Hebrew word Nazir which means to be separated, to be set apart for a purpose, to be consecrated. Now, there are five basic features of the Nazarite vow. I'm not going to get real rabbinical on you here. I'm just going to go real high level and give you the, the, the broad brush strokes. The first thing is it is voluntary. There is no Old Testament law that says you must take a Nazarite vow. It is completely voluntary. Number two, a man or a woman could do it. A man or woman could do it for any number of reasons. They could do it out of thanksgiving for recovering from an illness. They could do it out of thanksgiving to God for having a child being born. Or, or they would just say, God, you've given me such a good life. For the next 30 days, I'm going to devote myself wholly and solely and utterly to you and do whatever you need me to do. But a man or a woman could do it. Third, it, there was a specific time frame. The vow had a beginning time and an ending time. It was never open-ended, if you will. The fourth uh, feature is, at the end of the vow period, you had to go through some ceremonial stuff. You had to make some sacrifices. You had to have a, a sin offering. You had to have, and this is kind of odd, a hair offering. And you'll understand a little more about that in a minute. You had to offer your hair on an altar in the temple. So there was an ending period and there was a ceremony. And the final thing, this is very you know, germane to what we're going to talk about today, there were some restrictions on you if you took this Nazarite vow. If you said, hey, I'm going to take a Nazarite vow for the next 30 days, there are some things that you were not allowed to do. The first thing you were not allowed to do is you could not ingest anything from a vine. You could not eat a grape. You could not eat a raisin. You could not drink grape juice, fermented wine, beer. You could not eat grape seeds, grape leaves. Nothing to do with anything that grows on a vine could be ingested into your body. Some of the more strict interpretations of this would include tomatoes, no V8, no cucumber or cucumber juice, no, nothing from a vine. But we know for sure it was the grapevine. You could have nothing to do with anything that came from a grapevine. The second thing was, if you took a Nazarite vow, you were not allowed to cut your hair. You could scratch your hair, you could braid your hair, you could brush your hair, but you could not cut your hair. This was an outward symbol. This was to show people, hey, I am, I am taking a Nazarite vow. Uh, that's why my hair is growing. So don't ask me to go bowling. I'm busy. I've got things that God needs me to do right now, so I'm not going to cut my hair. The last restriction, so no grapes, right? No cutting your hair. The last thing was you were not allowed to go near dead bodies, human or animal. If you were under a Nazarite vow and you had a death in the family, you could not go to the wake. You could not go to the funeral. You had to avoid anything to do with dead bodies. You could not go see the corpse. So you got three restrictions, right? No vines, no clips, no steps. There are the three restrictions. When you took the Nazarite vow, this is what you had to avoid. I'm immersing myself in God and I'm getting rid of this stuff for a while. So I know what you're thinking right now. You're saying, look, uh, you're reading the story of Samson and this angel is saying to his mother, this guy's going to be a Nazarite. That doesn't sound very voluntary. This guy hasn't even been conceived yet, and you've already assigned him this complete immersion. And by the way, if you recall, it said, from his birth, he will be a Nazarite. From the minute he's born, he's under the vow. Later on in the passage, he goes on to say, the, the man goes on to say, and he will be that way till the day he dies. It wasn't some 30-day thing for Samson. Samson was being born into this vow. Pretty rare. Matter of fact, there's two other examples in the Bible of someone being born into a Nazarite vow. One in the Old Testament. Anyone know who it is? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> there's a woman named Hannah. I already alluded to her. She was in the temple praying because she was childless. She was begging God, please give me a child. And God brings forth from her Samuel. Samuel was a Nazarite. Again, interestingly enough, Manoah's wife couldn't have kids. Once a kid gets one, purpose back to God. Elizabeth, uh, uh, Hannah wants a child, can't have one. Samuel's given to her, she gives him back to God. And there's a New Testament example. Anyone? No. Who? John the Baptist. Bingo. 
Elizabeth couldn't have kids. Matter of fact, the, the Bible says she was postmenopausal. There's no way she's having a kid. God comes to her, gives her John the Baptist. John the Baptist repurposed back to God. See that? God gives miraculously with a purpose. Okay, so we got an angel coming to Manoah's wife, saying, hey, listen, you haven't had any kids, but you're going to have a son, and he's going to be a Nazarite. She's overwhelmed. She's happy. She goes to Manoah, tells Manoah everything that this angel told her, and as a good, supportive husband, what does Manoah do? He gets on his hands and knees and prays to God, God, can you please send that person back here, because my wife is spouting all kinds of stuff, and I don't really know what's going on here. Can you send this person back? So what does God do? Sends the angel back. You know what he tells Manoah? The same exact thing he told his wife. Here's another little tip from your Uncle Jay. Can you see what, can you see Manoah's wife standing in the corner? Oh yeah, someone else, tell, a stranger tells you something, you believe him. I tell you something and you go run into God, God, I, you know, I, just get that little tip for free there this morning. So Samson is born as a Nazarite. He's going to begin this deliverance of God's people from the Philistines. We don't know much about Samson. We know nothing about his childhood, in fact. But can you imagine the childhood this poor kid had? First of all, he's the first and possibly only child of a woman. You think she's going to be a helicopter mom? <laughs> and he's been dedicated to God. Well, I'm going to go bungee jumping with the boys. You're not going bungee jumping. No, you're dedicated to God. I, you can't be hurt. Mom, I want to get a mohawk. No, you cannot cut your hair. I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. No, there's grapes in the jelly. Mama Chariot just hit a chicken. Let's go look at the dead body. No, you can't go near there. He was restricted. Mom, I want to be a fireman. No, you're a Nazarite. You're not going to be a fireman. You're going to be what God tells you to be. No haircuts, no grapes, no dead bodies. So the Bible basically skips his childhood. And the first thing we find in chapter 14, he's a young man. And here's what we find. Samson, he's a young man now, went down to the city of Timnah where he saw a Philistine woman. When he returned home, he said to his father and mother, I saw a Philistine woman in Timnah. I want you to get her for me so I may marry her. His father and mother answered, Surely, isn't there someone among the Israelites that you can marry? Do you have to marry a woman from the Philistines, from the uncircumcised? But Samuel sa Samson said, Get me that woman. I want that one. Samson's parents did not know that the Lord wanted this to happen because he was looking for a way to challenge the Philistines who were ruling over the Israelites at this time. Do I detect a little bit of self-centeredness here on Samson's part? A little bit of spoiled child syndrome? I want that one! Give it to me now! Interesting. Here we have the man who is to deliver God's people from the Philistines. And the first thing we find him doing in Scripture is wanting to marry one of these pagan women. Interesting. I'm sensing some rebellion here on his part. Now, you may want to let Samson off the hook a little bit because what it says here in verse 4, there's this little parenthetical statement that, you know, the parents didn't know that God really wanted this to happen. As you continue to read through the story of Samson, I want you to understand what this is really trying to tell you. What this is really trying to tell you is Samson's going to do what Samson wants to do no matter what God wants, but God is going to use Samson, even when he makes poor decisions, to have his will completed. Over and over as we go through this story, it's not God's will, it's Samson's will be done. And oh, by the way, God's will is getting done on the back burner. So it's Samson's desire to marry this pagan woman. So his parents give in to him, give him what he wants. They travel back with Samson to Timnah to make arrangements for this wedding. And, and as they're traveling, mom and dad go on ahead to Timnah. And Samson stops along the way. And he stops, of all places, he stops at a vineyard. <laughs> now, the Bible doesn't say anything that he went and had some grapes or ate some grape leaves or anything like that. But I find it interesting that this is where he decides to stop. At the one place, the one kind of food that he's not allowed to be around, he stops at the vineyard. And while he's there, the Bible tells us that he is attacked by a young lion. And it's at this time we see the very first time that God miraculously intervenes in Samson's life. Let's go to the scripture. Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah as far as the vineyard near there. Suddenly, a young lion came roaring towards Samson. 
The Spirit of the Lord entered Samson with great power, and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands. For him, it was as easy as tearing apart a young goat. But Samson did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So arrangements are being made down in Timnah, and this was what happened several days later. Several days later, Samson went back to marry her. On his way, he went over to look at the body of the dead lion and found a swarm of bees with honey in it. Wait a minute, Samson. No vines, no clips, no stiffs. What are you doing? He's going over to look at the dead body of the lion. Again, I'm sensing that he doesn't take his Nazarite vow very seriously. You're not supposed to have any kind of contact with dead animals, dead bodies, and here you are going, but guess what? It gets worse. Samson got some of the honey with his hands. He reaches inside the corpse of this animal and pulls out some honey, and he walked along eating it. When he came to his parents, he gave them some. They ate it too, but Samson didn't tell, didn't tell mom and dad where the honey came from. When we finish with services on Sunday morning and after we finish chatting, you know, after services, usually we're pretty hungry and a lot of us scurry home to eat lunch. Some of us can't wait that long we go to a restaurant. But you know, I don't think any of us would like get out on 495 and pull over and see a deer carcass and see if there was a Twinkie inside of it that they could eat. <laughs> not only, not only has, 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 has Samson violated his Nazarite vow again, but this guy's disgusting. <laughs> this guy's a pig. So let's just recap here for a minute. God, God gives Manoah's wife a child, which she couldn't have, to lead Israel to freedom. And so far, he's intent on marrying a pagan woman. He's broken his vow by sticking his hand inside of a dead body. And he's a disgusting pig. OK? <laughs> and it doesn't end there. Because we start to learn more and more about this guy. Samson's father went down to see the Philistine woman, and Samson gave a feast, as was the custom for the bridegroom. Just a little note here. This customary feast they're talking about, seven-day feast, it was a kegger. It was, it, was, it was a drinking festival. There was going to be lots of great products being served at this feast, and that's where Samson is. Again, the Bible doesn't say that he indulged in any of it. You infer what you want to infer about it. When the people, when the Philistines saw him there, they sent 30 of their friends to be with him. Samson said to them, let me tell you a riddle. Try to find the answer during the seven days of the feast. If you can, I'll give you 30 linen shirts and 30 changes of clothes. But if you can't, you must give me 30 linen shirts and 30 changes of clothes. So they said, tell us your riddle so that we can hear it. Samson, the man set apart by God, consecrated to his efforts, likes to gamble. He likes to gamble. He's hoping that he can use his vow-breaking, stomach-turning act with the dead lion into a brand new wardrobe. So he tells him this, he tells him the riddle, that Samson's riddle is this, out of the eater comes something to eat. Out of the strong comes something sweet. After three days, these guests were racking their brain trying to figure out what the answer was to this riddle. The eater, of course, is the lion, right? The sweet is the honey. After three days, they couldn't figure it out, and they're starting to get a little agitated. So you know what they do? They go to Samson's new Philistine wife, their sister, their Philistine sister, and they say, listen, you better tell us the answer to this riddle, or we're going to burn you and your father alive. How's that? So, you know, Samson's new pagan Philistine wife that he wasn't supposed to marry in the first place starts laying a guilt trip on him. Here's another little tip from your Uncle Jay. Listen carefully. <laughs> Wife comes to him and says, you hate me. If you loved me, you would fill in the blank. You'd tell me the, the answer to this riddle if you really loved me. And Samson says, don't go tell you. I haven't even told my mom and dad about this. Why would I tell you? And so you know what the new pagan Philistine bride that he wasn't supposed to marry in the first place does? She cries for seven days. Day in, day out. She cries and 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 cries. And so finally, Samson gives in showing us another little bit of one of his weaknesses. He gives in and he tells her the answer to the riddle, which she turns around and tells the 30 guests. They come back to Samson and they say, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? Samson, not very pleased with this, 
Guys, again, listen. If you had not plowed with my young cow, you would not have solved my riddle. Guys, young men, never refer to your wife as any type of farm animal, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is not wise. Just another tip from your Uncle Jay. So now, Samson has a gambling debt that he needs to repay. And the scripture said once again that the Lord, this is interesting, he has to pay off a gambling debt, but the Lord intervenes again. It says the Spirit of God came upon him, like he did with a lion, and he was filled with this great strength. And with this great strength, he goes to a neighboring Philistine city, and he kills 30 men. And from these dead men, he takes everything they own, including their clothes. He comes back, pays off his gambling debt. He's very angry, and you know what he does then? He's so angry that he leaves his new pagan Philistine wife that he wasn't supposed to marry in the first place anyway, leaves her with her dad, and he goes home to his father's house. Boom, done. So much for the honeymoon. <laughs> Let me ask you something at this point in the story. Has God's purpose been served? Has God's purpose been served. I mean, three, uh, 30 Philistine men, the men that God wants to get away from his people, they're dead now. He wants to get the, his people away from the Philistines. He wants to remove them from captivity. They're dead. Samson has thir murdered 30 men. So God's purpose in this one small act is starting to be served. Was it because Samson was one to serve God and do what was right for God? No, he wanted to pay off a gambling debt. But God somehow took that and used it to move his will forward. This is another repetitive theme in Samson's life that we're going to see, that he seeks his own purpose time after time after time, but somehow God's purpose is met. Now let's recap once again what we know about Samson. Samson has married a pagan woman. He stuck his hand inside of a corpse. He's really disgusting. He likes to gamble. He called his wife a cow. He murdered 30 men to pay a gambling debt and he abandoned his wife. Oh, he's a keeper. <laughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the one you want, this is the guy you want your daughter to bring home, isn't it? He's a keeper. And we're only through two chapters of the four chapters of this guy's life. Chapter 15 starts out with what I consider to be pretty typical male behavior. Samson has abandoned his wife at his father's house in Timnah. He goes back to her house, and then after a couple months during the harvest season, he decides he's going to go back down to Timnah and see his wife, because she's just been sitting there waiting, pining for him the whole time, waiting for him to come back. He comes back into the father-in-law's house and says, I'm going up to my wife's room to see my wife. And he goes, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not? Hey, you left angry. You abandoned your wife here with me, so you know what I did? I gave your wife to the best man in your wedding. She's with him now. Samson goes into a rage. And this is what he says. This time, no one will blame me for hurting you Philistines. Samson has a gift. He has a gift that somehow in his mind, he can transfer the guilt from the things he has done on to the Philistine nation. He's the one with the gambling debt. He's the one that murdered 30 men. He's the one that left his wife. But somehow, they did this to him. And now he's in a rage. Samson is able to project guilt for his action conveniently upon God's enemies. And the scripture said that Samson goes out and he catches 300 foxes. He took two foxes at a time and tied their tails together. And to the tails, he tied a torch. Then he lit the torch, and he let the foxes run through the Philistine grain fields. And he burned up all their standing grain, all their stockpiled grain, burned up their olive trees, all of their vineyards, burnt to a crisp. Well, the Philistines are obviously probably not thrilled with Samson's actions. They say, who, who did this? And someone said, Samson, the son-in-law of the man from Timnah, he did this because his father-in-law gave his wife to the best man. So the Philistines burned Samson's wife and her father to death. Samson did X, someone else paid Y. Then Samson said to the Philistines, since you did this, I will not stop until I pay you back. This is Samson in a nutshell, this phrase. To the day he dies, this is the way Samson lives his life. 
you did this to me, now I'm going to do this to you. It's not a phrase of holiness or righteousness or I'm going to serve God and do this. It's revenge driven by raid. But in all of this, despite his bad acts, despite his impure motives, in all of this, God's will is slowly being worked out. One thing you got to learn, one thing we learn from this story is even when God's people are ungodly, God's will will prevail. So let's recap one more time, shall we? Here is God's chosen dude. He married a pagan woman. He stuck his hand in the side of a carcass. He's really disgusting. He likes to gamble. He called his wife a cow. He murdered 30 people to pay a gambling debt. He abandoned his wife. He transfers his guilt to other people. He has anger issues. He lives for vengeance. He's cruel to foxes. And he causes the death of his wife and father. And now he killed some more Philistines to pay back that death, even though he really abandoned his wife anyway to begin with. I didn't hear about this in Sunday school. <laughs> this was not the story they sold me. I'm a little less impressed with Samson than I was when I was a little kid. Can it possibly get any worse than this? Oh, it does. Much worse. I'm going to tell you how much worse. Next week, I'm going to tell you how much worse. <laughs> There's so much R-rated stuff in this story, it's going to take me two weeks to do it. We'll take a look and see if we can draw any helpful conclusions about a train wreck of a life. A life whose mistakes and poor decisions seem to start off small and innocuous, but continue to snowball and get larger until at the end we find a man standing under an avalanche. Everything we looked at this morning in this man's life stemmed from one decision that he made, a decision that was contrary to God's will, and one decision that led to rage and revenge and pain and death. A life that was supposed to be Nazarite, set apart, different, consecrated, now lies in ruin. And the very same thing can happen to us. Maybe this is the first great lesson that we can learn from the life of Samson. Even though as Christians we've been consecrated, we've been set apart, we have a purpose, and even though as Christians the Spirit of God gives us knowledge and power to do the things we need to do, if we lose sight of God's purpose for our life, our life will end up in ruin too because what he has given you, he gives to you for a purpose. He has a motive for giving you what he gives you. You are to be fully consecrate, consecrated, fully immersed in the purposes of God. We'll finish looking at Samson next week, but in the meantime, I'd like to ask you to look at the choices you're making. Do they line up with God's purpose for your life? Are the things that you're pursuing, are they in agreement with God's purpose and where he's going? Or are you using your time, your resource, and the energy that, that you've been given to pursue your own selfish desires? To pursue revenge? To feed your own self-centered lusts? Until we gather again next week, let's all agree to look at ourselves and to make sure that we're worthy of our Nazarite vow. Listen, when you were baptized in, this, in the baptistry, when you were born again, your Nazarite vow kicked in. And it's a lifetime vow. From the rebirth to when you face death, you are to be fully immersed in God's will. And let's be sure that God's design is being accomplished because of us and not in spite of us. Let's all stand together and sing.